In this library chat, I interview my father, Fan Gongtam, about his encounters with the former president and sometimes emperor of the Central African Republic, Jean Bédel Bokassa. Bokassa served as president of the Central African Republic from 1966 to 1976, and then some three additional years as a self-declared emperor from 1976 until his overthrow in 1979. His rulership has garnered much attention for diverse allegations of brutality, and his life is also one that is irrevocably intertwined with French colonialism. After having served in an African unit of the Armée Française de la Libération, or French Free Forces, during World War II, Bokassa headed to French Indochina to work as a transmissions expert in 1950. For his service in the First Indochina War, Bokassa was honored with the Légion d'honneur and the Croix de Guerre. During his time in Saigon, or present-day Ho Chi Minh City, he also fathered a daughter, who was named Martine. This is where Bokassa's life intersected with my father's. In a complicated diplomatic arrangement, the Central African Republic requested the government of South Vietnam to locate and escort the true Martin Bokassa home to Bangui. In 1971, just a handful of years before Bokassa would declare himself emperor, my father was assigned to this task. His recollections of reuniting Jean Bédel Bokassa with his daughter provide a rare glimpse into the complex mind of one of the Central African Republic's most notorious leaders. And his story provides us with a dramatic yet intimate portrait of how the French Empire reached into the lives of its former colonies. It is the story of a peasant girl, a would-be emperor, and a government agent that runs from the streets of Saigon to a hotel in Nairobi, all the way to the presidential palace of Bangui. Let's turn now to my conversation with my father as he details this rare glimpse into French, Vietnamese, and Central African history, as well as the mind and heart of one of the most controversial figures of the 20th century. Well, um, my name is John Phan. I'm an assistant professor of East Asian Languages and Cultures at uh, Columbia University. And it's a great honor and pleasure to uh, sit down with my father, Tam Phan, today. We'll be discussing uh, a particularly a special and a very unique story that brings Africa and South Vietnam together in a post-colonial historical moment revolving a figure named Jean Bédel Bokassa. Uh, but before we begin, I'd like to um, allow my father to, to introduce himself a little bit and his role, uh, especially in the government of South Vietnam. Yes, my, my name is Tam Phan, and I... Uh, I uh, was uh, uh, I was working for uh, the Vietnamese government in Saigon uh, for about 13 years, um, and uh, uh, I was the unit I was attached to was uh, named the Central Intelligence Agency uh, Organization. I'm sorry, and we call it in short CIO. Mm -hmm. And uh, my position in there was, uh, uh, and they are using the code name for that, but uh, translated into practice, it was like the chip operation. And uh, I was also assigned to be uh, the special assistant to the commissioner for a special mission. Great. And so uh, I should, by way of background, mention that, of course, my father's career and the story we're going to, he's going to share with us today takes place during what is generally called the Vietnam War, in, during which there were, Vietnam, the country, was divided into northern and southern halves, the northern communist country, southern uh, democratic republic, um, and my father worked for the southern government. The figure we're going to be discussing today is a man named Jean Bédel Bocassa, who uh, was the president of the Central African Republic. Uh, until he uh, declared it the Central African Empire. He was born in um, 1921. His father was beaten to death by the French uh, Forestier Company for releasing workers, and his mother committed suicide shortly thereafter. Um, Bocasa was then educated in the French system, joined the colonial troops, and eventually the free French forces during World War II. And he fought in the First Indochina War until 1953, 
And it was during that time that he was stationed in Vietnam. He married a Vietnamese woman named Nguyen Thi Hue and had a daughter at that time. And the story my father will be talking about today involves his search for his half Vietnamese daughter after the end of that war. So I'd like to begin first uh, by asking you to tell us about Bocasa's first attempt to find his daughter in Vietnam. Who did he ask initially to help him with that? Yeah, it was in 1970, around 1970, that uh, the news broke out in Saigon uh, that uh, uh, there was a president of a cent of Africa country uh, who served in Vietnam uh, during the Indochina War wanted to look for his daughter that his father during, during his time of service in Vietnam. And um, the news broke out to the public and uh, the Vietnamese media seized the opportunity to commercialize it for their, uh, for their sale of papers. So they inflated the story and uh, uh, referring to Mr. Bokasa, not as the president, but like uh, the emperor or the king, and then, uh, and then uh, referring to uh, hit the daughter he was looking for at the princess, the lost princess. So they kind of commercialized it uh, to, to sell the paper. Mm -hmm. And uh, at that time, Mr. Bokasa went to the French uh, government which had a consulate in Saigon seeking assistance for finding his daughter. Uh, not too long after, uh, they, they were uh, they identified a uh, half Vietnamese and half African uh, uh, woman and uh, claiming to be the daughter of the President Bokassa. So the counselor made arrangement and sent the person to Bangui to be re reunified with his father. And this is the French consulate, right? Yeah, the French counselor, uh, counselor, uh, counselor office in Saigon. Mm -hmm. But after she arrived in uh, Bangui, Africa, Mr. Bokassa said that this person was not my biological daughter. Mm -hmm. So, and then at that point, um, uh, he uh, seemed to change his strategy. He did not uh, continue uh, requesting assistance from the French government anymore, but he went to the South Vietnamese uh, government, which had an embassy in his country in Bangui. Mm -hmm. uh, I should um, also mention that uh, uh, at that time, uh, Southern Africa was, uh, during the Vietnam War, was a country remote uh, t to Vietnam, not only by distance, but also because it had really no direct connection with the war. Uh, but the South Vietnamese government established uh, an embassy in Bangui, part of their competition for diplomatic gain to be recognized by the work international work. Uh, but uh, uh, Central Africa did not uh, have an embassy in Saigon. So um, the Vietnamese ambassador in Bangui received a request from Mr. Uh, Bokasa to find his daughter. And then according to the report by the ambassador, there was an implied threat that if the South Vietnamese government would parenthesis it, I should have mentioned before, it stay outside the issue before. When the issue arose in the media, the Vietnamese government didn't pay any attention to that. Mm -hmm. uh, until the ambassador report that uh, the, the government of, of Central Africa uh, emphasize that we must do the work otherwise they may uh, cut diplomatic relations. That means a loss of an embassy for, 
for South Vietnam that it potential gain for North Vietnam to come to Central Africa. Mm -hmm. So the issue suddenly became political. They're not only at that moment that the South Vietnamese government really jumped in. Mm -hmm. uh, then uh, began running an investigation and the church, uh, not too short, uh, too long after that, uh, the head daughter, real daughter, named Martin, uh, live in uh, in Bienwa, which is the city, coincidentally with my hometown anyhow, <laughs> uh, uh, in a city about 25 kilometers from Saigon. And she lived with her mother uh, and uh, working in a factory that uh, labor work, kind of labor work, in uh, near the mountain where they loaded uh, dynamite to uh, yes, to produce uh, material for the cement factory. Uh, and uh, her uncle, who is the brother of her mother, I was the one who only one who uh, uh, read the newspaper daily. Uh, so uh, he read the news on the paper, and uh, he he arranged make arrangement, and he took his Martin mother and her to Saigon to the Vietnamese M uh, Mid Department of Foreign Affairs. They were quickly. Uh, kick out mm -hmm. at uh, imposter <laughs> they they didn't believe but then when the um, when the government uh, the central government decided to get involved then then uh, uh, the government ran the police investigation mm -hmm. and the police reported back that that was the true the true uh, uh, true girl according to the interview they had with the mother so that was the police agency yeah. that the police ran that investigation. The what? The police. The police. Right. So the how? Vietnamese. Yeah. How did the CIO get involved with you, the mission? Oh yeah, and uh, and uh, the military of foreign affairs decided to uh, uh, to uh, make arrangement to send Martin to Bangui to be reunified, and according to the military of foreign affairs. They considered the, the trip to be uh, a little bit uh, risky. They they said that uh, that uh, the French government apparently apparently uh, lost the face hmm. that they did not find the real girl, so may make the the trip difficult for them because the shortest way to go to Bangui, Africa was stop over in Paris. And the military feared that the friend may uh, do something, a uh, kind of uh, presumption that I do not share. Hmm. Uh, the second uh, issue they raised was uh, North Vietnam may see the opportunity to sabotage the trip for a diplomatic gain. And uh, keep in mind that North Vietnam, but at that time, we concentrate on effort for the war. They have little uh, resource overseas. So North Vietnam may go to the uh, Chinese and Russian intelligence agency for help and may, may plot some kind of not of the uh, thing to uh, sabotage the trip, so they they um, did uh, they wrote a report to the president and uh, making two recommendations. Number one is the trip must be top secret. Number two is uh, they don't have the capacity for assuring the safety of the trip, so they request that the president to assign. The CIO, with by that moment, it structurally did, did not be, and it was an ind independent agency that under the direction only of the president. Mm -hmm. 
So at that time, that that why the CEO got involved, mm -hmm. and uh, I uh, remember I got called into the office of the commissioner, and uh, by the time I was notified of that, because it is a mission, a special mission that fell into my area of uh, responsibility, and uh, by the time I heard the trip about the trip was just a few days before their planned departure. So I had a short time to run the background check and and everything and uh, uh, and uh, prepare the trip to go and uh, we are faced uh, a lot of uh, difficulties. First of all, in my unit I do not have any qualified officer to send to do so, I had to do it myself. I don't mean that I'm qualified, but since there are no other one to assign to it, I had to do it. Number two, we, to be honest, the CAO by that time did not have resource overseas to protect the trip, namely in the in the area of Africa. Mm -hmm. So we are facing a very tough. Uh, Right. Uh, so you were uh, charged with a, a clandestine mission to bring her back to Africa without yeah. resources. Yeah. So can you tell us a little bit about, so the journey is you flew, you avoided Paris for the reasons you stated. So you flew first to India. Yes, uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs set the itinerary and bought a ticket. They basically avoid going by Paris and avoid any communist country. Mm. So the literary called for a first stop in Bangkok, which oh. is just near Via Saigon, and a friendly country. And the second stop uh, was in Bombay, mm -hmm. where we supposed to um, to wait from, we arrived, I think we arrived in Bombay about uh, in the evening and we had to wait until 6 o'clock the next day to catch a British airline to go to uh, Africa. And then we had to wait at the airport. And uh, so everyone of the delegation uh, sitting there uh, at the airport and trying to catch some sleep and I, I had to keep my eyes open on Martin uh, at about 3 o'clock in the morning. There was a fat man on tennis shoe walking over to me and and then say that I know who that girl is. Now if I can I make a deal with you and you if you let me take her picture, I will keep my mouth shut. <laughs> you you can see that I had no choice. Just uh, just trust that uh, his work. So I let him take the picture that the first international reporter that uh, got the picture of Martin before she arrived in Bangui. And after that he thanks me and he handed me uh, his business card. He was the editor of the Japanese newspaper Asahi Shinbum. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we departed um, uh, Bombay about six o'clock in the morning on British Airline and uh, five first class and I uh, I must uh, say that was uh, all of those was a uh, shock for Martin uh, number one and back in Saigon before the departure the military make her wear the outside mm -hmm. not the Vietnamese Vietnamese dress. That she never had to coming from a poor family, she never had to take a long dress anymore. Secondly, it from the intelligent basis, it was uh, attract and un, un, uh, and attention because you look at Martin looked more African than Vietnamese. She tall, big, and then dark, and it's seeing a lady. Wearing uh, the Vietnamese dress like this, it not, it's kind of rare, that act, mm -hmm. attract attention. And the mission was meant to be clandestine. You were supposed to do it in secret. Yeah, right? yeah. 
So, but they get on the plane too. She's full time. She flies. She very anti-medic, anti-medic, and uh, we flew first class. So uh, the flight attendant came to try to show attention to us. The more they did that, the more she got scared. Mm -hmm. And she keep looking at me. Uh, uh, what do I do? What do I do? Thing mm -hmm. like this. But uh, when we landed um, in Nairobi, that day is the next stop where we had to wait two days to catch a, a, a Cong African uh, air, airline uh, for the next trip. And uh, we had two days in Nairobi, so uh, I let the delegation go uh, out by themselves and I keep Martin with me and uh, so I had to take her downtown outside a little bit. And I had some picture that I shared to you. Right. And you can show it, uh, the mm -hmm. picture later. And uh, no incident in, in, in Nairobi. The next day we flew on uh, uh, African uh, airline uh, to, uh, from Nairobi to Brazzaville. Uh, in the Congo. Uh, mm -hmm. In Congo. And uh, here is uh, when we landed uh, there's a, there's a, I may say, uh, the, f the first incident in, on the trip. Um, when we walked to the terminal, there was four young men, African young men, just come over and grab us, grab my arm, grab what Martin had, and, 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 uh, and uh, push us to uh, the front door and throw it in the car without saying anything. <laughs> and then I noticed the car was driving, uh, driving out of the city in about 45 minutes until it get into a, like, look like a, a rural, a jungle area <coughs> rather, uh, and an isolated house there and then invited us to get off the car and go inside until about seven o'clock at night and there was someone who came in and asked us to come to the uh, room for a meeting. And we all went to the room for a meeting at the, the person in the room himself at he an official from the Congo government. Uh, he received a request from the President Bokassa to help transiting his, uh, his daughter to Bangui. So it's only by that time that, uh, to be honest with you, when I was uh, usher uh, uh, quickly to the car with the delegation, uh, the idea of being kidnapped came to my mind. Yeah. But when the official said that, and only about that time that I felt a relief, it basically after he said that, he received a request from President Bokassa, and he also added that, Tomorrow morning, President Bokassa will send his personal plane to come here to pick you up. Mm. So it's a, only at that time that I felt a relief. So the next day we went to the airport. Uh, there were the beach crab uh, air, uh, uh, landed there and, uh, and uh, the pilot, uh, with the pilot uh, who uh, took uh, at the uh, stair to uh, greet us and, and he is uh, uh, a white uh, French man uh, wearing a pilot uniform. Yeah. So it took us not too long to land it in Bangui and when we landed uh, there was a, a man who came to introduce himself at the, the, the Minister of uh, Protocol of the Government of Central Africa and he invited us. Um, here is uh, everything very very official. It was a VIP uh, reception room and get into a uh, motorcade and that took us to the president's office. It's called the president's palace. Uh, when we came to the president's palace, we came in to the huge room and uh, there all the diplomatic uh, and the government officials were, were sitting already there waiting. And we came in and we were sit uh, near the stage and then uh, there's a big chair reserved for the president and we sit there for 45 minutes 
until finally in the prison outrider. And then when he arrived, uh, he just looked calm. He did not say anything until uh, 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 one official came to us and invited us to walk to the room nearby. We walked to the room and then just briefly the, the president came into the room and shut the door. And he walked over to us without waiting for uh, to be introduced or anything. He just walked in over and looked at uh, Martin and he, he come to her and he he pulled down her trouser. After, after uh, explain to you the reason he did that because President Bokasa said that by the t time in Serkin Vietnam, as John mentioned, he f he uh, lived with a Vietnamese woman and had a daughter. But by the time he left the daughter, the daughter was a baby, about six months old, and uh, she had a the car uh, on the left thigh because because of a BCG vaccination. So that is the sign because uh, she she was a baby when he left. So what he 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 remembered the car. So he walked and he just pulled out her trouser right away. You know the Vietnamese women wear uh, very thin drawer and very easy. He pulled it out. That is, to me, um, I, I pay very close attention to that moment because even though we got the police report that she is really a real daughter, we, you never know. So I was watching if the uh, Bokasa to see if he, she is real or not. So I was watching his, his, uh, his act very closely. I was next to him. And when he pulled out the, the drawer, his expression in his face really, really changed very, uh, very uh, quickly. Then I took back to the uh, ambassador who took behind me, the Vietnamese ambassador, and I said, we got it. Mm -hmm. I did it the most beautiful moment that I had for the trip, uh, because he Chain of impression in his face not only told me that he uh, he recognized his daughter, but uh, I feel a kind of a compassion for uh, for him. The very uh, that the man found his daughter and uh, their feeling uh, lovely face in his face, and he start crying. So uh, before I made a trip, I ran a, a background check. The information I got about Mr. Bokasa was rather not very complimentary, uh, if not saying negative. But by that moment, it changed all of those in my mind. I felt a lot, a lot of sympathy for him. Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah. Well, you know, he is a man who is known for being violent. This story you're telling us occurred in 1971. Is that right? Yeah. So it is uh, a few years after he overthrew uh, the previous president. Who was his uncle. Who was his uncle, right. And only five years before he overthrew the government and declared the Central African Empire. Um, so, uh, can, you know, you describe a very tender moment between him and his daughter in, you know, when he finally is reunited with her. Can you talk a little bit about how he treated you and the delegation for the rest of your trip? Um, yeah, then after that, and... Uh then the Vietnamese ambassador began to uh, introduce the delegation to Bokassa. And uh, he introduced uh, for the chief of the delegation, who was the uh, secretary general of the Vietnamese Department of, of Foreign Affairs, uh, who was the, named the chief of the delegation. And after that, he introduced uh, the reporter. Mm -hmm. One of the uh, reporter, uh, Vietnamese reporter of the newspaper in Saigon named Trang Deng, that's a daily newspaper. Uh, he said that this reporter was, should be credited for finding uh, Bokasa's uh, daughter because of his uh, article 
continue this article on the, the media and then his private investigation that led to the finding of it and make it, uh, he mm-hmm. emphasized a lot about the role of that uh, of that reporter and uh, and of course uh, the other party of the delegation was Bokassa Vietnamese uh, partner when he lived in Vietnam mm-hmm. and then me at the last and he came to uh, introduce me to uh, President Bokassi said that this is Colonel Tam. He is the chief security of President Thieu. And the reason President Thieu sent his uh, chief security to go on a trip where he so concerned about the safety of your daughter. Uh, uh, so, you know, all of those were diplomatic talk, <laughs> you know. I, I were not the, the president who chief security at all. Mm-hmm. I work for the CIO. Mm-hmm. But the, I think the the, the ambassador got excited. And the, but then, uh, and then after they introduced that, uh, with the Bokasa made a general statement. Although we were waiting for him to come and hug the reporter because uh, thanks to that man that uh, that he found his daughter, but he did not. He talked by stating, expressing his uh, gratitude to President, the President of South Vietnam. He said that the thanks to President Thieu that my daughter is in a lie and I am reunified with him, with her. I do not know if that was an oversight or, or anything that, uh, but uh, he did not uh, thank the Vietnamese um, report at all. At, he may have done it after that privately, I do not know. But at the time, not. and then he walked over to me, right to me, and he, he shook my hand for the second time. And he said, uh, uh, you are a colonel, I like the military. <laughs> and then began to say, uh, if without president, your president, my daughter would not be alive. Now I want you to come back and tell your president that I want to thank him deeply for saving the life of my daughter and bring her over to me. And secondly, Tell him that if ever he been overthrown by a coup, he will, would be welcome in Central Africa. Yeah. And this is six years after Bokas himself initiated a coup. Yeah. Right. And, then, uh, and then he uh, looked at me and said, you guy, you must, be, you must have done a good job. Nobody could overthrow President Hill. <laughs> Which was not my duty at all. So. And then the delegation where uh, the reception consider ended and uh, we were, uh, he said that uh, the minister of protocol will take us to our hotel where we stay. And uh, the minister of protocol came up and then uh, and with uh, another man and the other man take uh, 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 te- te- the delegation and then he came to me he said you go with me mm-hmm. and I came out and he put me in his car he drove me to a tall building uh, uh, near the river and um, and uh, you know by that time you know that I was separated from the, the delegation uh, I do not know the reason but I was I know I was separated from the delegation. And when we uh, the car stopped at the, the front gate of the door, I saw there's a half blood, half a squad of uh, owner guard. I thought it was for for the uh, delegation chief because you know diplomatic relation that owner owner should go to him. Mm. But he wasn't with me on the car, nor did I know any car behind me at all. So I walked in and he took me to the sixth floor 
I think the building had about 12 or 20 uh, 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 floor with the only dorm building in the city. Uh, and then we enter a room very uh, nicely, a room, and he pointed a picture on the wall up, uh, up, up uh, and he said that this is the picture of the president of Congo. He lived in this room last week. And he said that uh, the, we want to give you the best uh, reception that we could by order of the president. So and he pointed uh, a few things explaining what in the room and he pointed to uh, a rose on the desk and said, this is fresh rose that I write here every morning from Paris. So I, uh, by that time, uh, the, the fear uh, came back to the, my mind with uh, replaced by uh, a wonder. I do not know why I was treated uh, in a special way like this. Mm -hmm. uh. Right. And you mentioned uh, in other conversations that you were waiting to go back to Vietnam, right? And uh, Professor Wakasa, in fact, prevented you from leaving at a certain point, is that right? Oh, I had been about seven days uh, in Bangui, and um, uh, I, uh, right after we delivered the, 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 my order was right after we delivered the girl, I should report back to the Vietnamese government as soon as possible. And according to my boss, the president said that he does not want any media in the foreign nation to bring that picture before he see it himself. So I was in a hurry uh, to leave the country uh, in order to send uh, the picture to the president. So I will answer that we're waiting uh, to be um, to receive the order to to fly out of Central Africa. But uh, no order, and uh, we were treated, and the delegation were invited to have dinner with the president a few times, and uh, and the first uh, uh, dinner with the president was at a small restaurant uh, in in Bangui. Uh, that's the only Vietnamese restaurant, anyhow, uh, with the name of the. Uh, uh, Vietnamese restaurant and uh, uh, we came in there and uh, I, th I think the owner is a, is a French uh, person. Uh, I, I think he rather, his name is Jui and he's rather half French, half Vietnamese hmm. and uh, we had Vietnamese food by that time and this sort of thing continued uh, and uh, the president uh, enjoyed those meetings a lot because that uh, he brought back his memory of Vietnam. Uh, I recall a few times that uh, that uh, he sit down, he drink, he drink a lot of uh, a lot of uh, whiskey and uh, and cognac. But when he drink, after he drink, and he he talk, he took a guitar. And he played and he sang the Vietnamese song that looked like a Cô Mười, Cô Chín, Hai Cô Mày Muốn, Cô Nào. That was, in, he sang that in Vietnamese. But I can translate for you like a, uh, like a, like a, you know, during the French time uh, in uh, Indochina War, French soldiers, one, one day I have free time when I was looking for Vietnamese women, <laughs> you know. Uh, and uh, somebody wrote a song like uh, addressing to a friend, told her, if you want it, you go to that family, they have many girls. But if you want to take one of them today, make sure you don't tell her mother. <laughs> so that was a song. And he learned that, and he played, and he played, you can see the enthusiastic uh, in his face. And, and the other Vietnamese work he know a lot was uh, the swearing work. <laughs> yeah, he talked everything started by the by the the swearing work like a most 
uh, a Vietnamese uh, soldier do, you know, they talk by saying that that's where he worked before they talk. And uh, he, when I, he, saw, he saw his finger to me and he said, look, uh, that two bit uh, fire truck hit me in front of, uh, of, the, of the fire department inside and I broke my finger. <laughs> and uh, he said, he's wearing, he said, make uh, the two bit uh, fireman <laughs> in Vietnamese. But he talked to Phil Vietnam, he enjoyed, he enjoyed the moment with us. He never, in the moment, never asked about uh, uh, what the, our trip or about the government in Vietnam, about politics, anything. He just talked about his memory in Vietnam before. Mm -hmm. He he seems to have had warm memories about Vietnam, especially his daughter. I mean, he you mentioned he was really moved, obviously, when he was reunited. No, he did not really talk about her at all. Right, but in the moment that he was reunited. Yeah. Yeah. But then you did eventually get the order to leave, right? And you were um, informed. And I, as I said, I waited for all the order every day until one week later. Mm -hmm. You can, can imagine how nervous I was and... Uh, we had the embassy in Vietnam, they had no capacity to communicate with Saigon, right. either by radio or anything, generally by mail. Uh, until a week, one week there, then we received the order that we could leave. So uh, uh, the head of the delegation told me that be ready tomorrow, six o'clock, fly out from Bangui to Paris. Mm -hmm. So I was preparing parking. We had a last dinner at the ambassador house and and I came back to the room parking, getting ready. It was about 11 o'clock. That the phone kept ringing, so I thought it was the ambassador. I didn't dare, I didn't care to answer his phone. Yeah. So until I heard a knock at the door, and I opened the door, it was the Minister of Protocol. He said that the President is downstairs. He uh, he's having a dancing part, he wants you to go down there. So I was in pyjama, but I had to put on, dress up with a tie, and I walked down there to the hall, and nobody got dressed up. Everyone wearing like a casual, casual, um, a dress with the shirt with the work Papa Bocasa on the on the chest, and people were dancing, drinking, happy, and I was uh, taking near the president, not next to him, near about five or six, six near to him, and uh, when I saw the president, uh, I said, and he uh, just uh, not back, but he did not come to 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 take my hand or anything. And then I was shown to a chair there, and he was from this time was talking to say that the lady next to you, her husband, uh, uh, was a colonel, you know, and he was in mission. <laughs> he kind of, that kind of joke he, he liked to do. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we sit there for a while, and, and certainly I do not know how to dance, and I so the lady uh, tried several times were looking at me, but I did not. <laughs> I did not know how to dance that way. So I sit there for a moment, I, uh, and then uh, until I, when people were moving out, so I got closer to him and I said, uh, 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 "Mr. President, I, I am leaving to tomorrow uh, to go back to Vietnam," and he didn't answer me, but he. He do like this, and then one officer came up over, and he looked up to the officer and say, "Make sure the airport is closed tomorrow." Mm. Well, I was really shocked. I didn't know. He did not talk to me. He talked to the officer. I did not know what to do. I sit there for a while. He looked back and said, "Tomorrow I'm going hunting, and you go with me." Yeah. Well, I went back to my room. Uh, devastated <laughs> and did not know what was going on. Uh, so I was prepared the next day um, that I would go hunting with him. Uh, well, uh, the next day I woke up about 5 o'clock and uh, 
waited anxiously to be uh, and uh, nobody came to my room to get me to go out hunting and then they get into the time that have to be at the airport <laughs> so I get on a car and go to the airport and no no off the and then I get on a Air France fly but uh, not even sure that nobody would come and stop the the flight yeah. until the flight took off and and uh, over chat that I felt a relief that I am really uh, safe now. Yeah. And the main point is that that sort of encounter right before you actually made it out of Central African Republic was after a week of Bokasa seeming to court you or seeming to sort of want to bring you into some kind of a position. I, um, I um, as I said earlier, I uh, realized that when I was taking to the uh, room of lodging, I noticed that I had uh, received a, a patient treatment. I did not know what, but I um, remember the few joke he made to me and I I that the thing became we put the dot together so I came in um, uh, number one as you recall I just said a moment ago he came to me he said that you must have done a good job nobody could overthrow president to you and uh, the next job, uh, joke he made to me, well, this is a joke, not a serious thing, but who knows. He said that uh, if you come here well, for me, I'll make you a general. And then after that, at the last dinner with the embassy, uh, with the ambassador, Vietnam ambassador, I, uh, I talked, I chat with the ambassador a little bit, the ambassador said that, you know, uh, one thing the president uh, uh, Bokasa uh, cared the most was uh, his safety. Nobody overthrow him. Mm -hmm. So every day, nobody know, including all his closest aid. Nobody know where he would be spending the night mm. for fear of uh, overthrow. So he may be interested in in his personal safety. So mm -hmm. I thought that he was. Uh, that motivate that explain to me now hit attention to yeah and as we mentioned earlier this is occurring just a few years five years before he uh, overthrows the government and declares the Central African Empire well you know we don't have much time left but you you've given us a very interesting portrait of a man a complex man who has a very rich reputation for violence particularly for dictatorship but also he has this very tender moment with his daughter. So I wonder if we can end by you giving first your impressions of, just a, your general impression of the personality of Bokasa himself. Yeah, I, uh, I, I did some uh, reading before departure, and, and as I said earlier, rather not very complimentary about President Bokasa, but at the moment of him uh, reunited with his daughter, I felt a lot of compassion for the man, and uh, I feel uh, the, the father and daughter love in there, and I, you know, I, I, a lot of sympathy uh, I had for him by the, yeah. that time, uh, and uh, he's a good man, a good father. Now, I also heard from the ambassador a lot about his uh, violent uh, acts in there. But certainly I was there uh, during for a week. Mm -hmm. I did not witness any one of those sort of things at all words I, I heard. Uh, but uh, if I may that, uh, make a judgment, and I think uh, uh, he is surely an unpredictable man. Mm -hmm. Yeah, You don't know what is going on in his mind and things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, Next is, uh, 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 I recall uh, 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 he uh, meeting one of his aides uh, in the palace. During the reception, there were the white men uh, on way standing there, dressed up and beside him. And uh, I, 
I came to uh, talk to the man here, introduce himself here, uh, Monsieur Alexandre. Uh, he is an advisor to the president, political advisor. And uh, one during the conversation, casual, and uh, he talked and he said, the president said on top gay. It's cracked. Uh, but it's a joke. It's a joke. And uh, so I think, uh, I do agree that uh, he is unpredictable, but I do not think uh, uh, he crazy. Mm. So as I said, it was a joke rather than, and uh, many calculate that it's not, mm. but he unpredictable. Now his violent temper, I had no way to, to jet it. Well, I'd like to ask you one final question about Martine herself. So you, you mentioned her as a kind of typical Vietnamese country girl. So after you, you know, reunited her with her father, she moved to Central African Republic from her home. Did you ever think about her after that? Did you ever wonder what happened to her? No, I do not. Uh, all I know anything about her was uh, reading. Mm -hmm. I don't ha did not have any communication with her after I delivered her to her father. Mm -hmm. All I knew about her was came from the news. Uh, but uh, Martin was a, a, a nice, uh, honest uh, uh, Vietnamese uh, country girl. You know. mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, she very sincere, very forthcoming, uneducated, but very, uh, very good characters. And and uh, uh, she's uh, the thing. One of the thing was uh, um, uh, I noticed in her was this person was she. She did not appear to be like I could. You could have imagined for any any uh, ordinary girl who received such a fascinating news like this mm -hmm. to be excited. She did not look to me that uh, she looked she very glad to make the trip to go to see her father, which, whom she, of course, she never met. He left when she was six months old, mm -hmm. but she she happy to do that, but she never showed uh, uh, like uh, over excited or mm -hmm. anything. And uh, and uh, uh, she very very uh, for comic, uh, very sincere character, and a uh, uh, good uh, good. Uh, right, and of course she lives to this day in France, I believe. Yeah. I I know. See, I I read the news, and I know I have a friend who uh, who um, who was uh, my classmate, a friend uh, high school before. Who know where she in here? But mm. I did not ask her uh, mm. any further. Well, thank you so much. I, I think you know the thing that's really fascinating about your story is that first of all, it's a story of it's a, many different stories in one. It's a story of two former colonies of France intersecting in an unpredictable way in the context of the Cold War. It's the story, as you described it, a fairy tale. You know, of uh, a lost daughter being reunited with her father. But it's also, I think, a really fascinating glimpse into the mind of a very complicated man. You know, Bokassa has an incredibly complicated uh, uh, reputation history. He was overthrown a few years after this, you know, um, and was charged with multiple war crimes. And of course, his family history continues in a very complicated way after this story. But I don't think we get very many personal sort of um, glimpses into his mind like the one that you gave us. I just want to mention before we leave that, of course, you shared um, versions of this story as well as other sort of contextual information about it at a symposium at, Cor at Cornell many years ago, uh, out of which there was uh, a book, Voices from the Second Republic of South Vietnam. The story is also documented here, uh, edited by Keith Taylor and published by Cornell. So um, there are other forms in which the story lives on. But uh, it's wonderful to have you share it orally with us today. Thank you again so much for the afternoon. Thank you. Thank you for having